There we go. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Let's get started. Everyone hear me okay? Hopefully. Is this going over the... Can you hear it in the speakers? Through the speakers? Okay, great. Awesome. That way you know it's working for our Zoomers. Um, this is the... This is the week of love, right? Yeah. What is something that you guys love? What's something that you are grateful for? If anything. Nothing? <laughs> no love. No love. Grateful for what? We are an ungrateful. Oh, wow. Wow. I was, I was hoping you were going to come out and turn it around here for us. Please. Um, because actually I just did a gratitude thing. So I'm grateful for all the amazing clients that I have and the amazing opportunity that I've been able to build a successful business in such a little time. So awesome. Yeah. Clients, opportunity, business. Love it. Thank you for sharing. Yep. I was going to try to repeat, but I won't do it justice. Okay. I didn't do that one justice either. <laughs> I'm grateful for just like the community here at KW and and all the people who came a little early. We meet at 10 o'clock at the gray sofas if anyone's looking for some friends. And it's so fun to have people to talk to about real estate and life and and just compare ideas and what we're doing that's working and what's not working. And it just, it it makes it feel closer to everyone so Excellent. i'm grateful for that awesome did you guys hear that invitation what's that invitation so every tuesday at 10 a.m we currently meet at the grace sofas upstairs but if it gets bigger we'll just come down here and it's just anyone who wants to come like if you're a solo agent or a team agent it's awesome because we talk about like what we're doing marketing or schedule blocking or you know who we're going through for leads how we're getting business what we're doing and it's just a very, um, I don't know the right word, but we're just, it's helping each other. It's not competition, it's community. Mm -hmm. And it's just really a fantastic place to to feel like you're part of it, part of things, something awesome. bigger. I love that. Okay, Tuesdays at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Um, any more love in here? Anything else? Uh, gratitude, grateful? All the things. I am grateful for, uh, I have an upcoming day to spend with my uh, younger brother. He is, time is short. So. Hmm. Awesome. Um, oh, thank you. Yes. You know, I mine's going to be kind of odd, but I'm really grateful for some of the challenges and hard things that I have been able to go through lately or am in the middle of. And that's because it is helping me to become stronger. So I really do have a deep gratitude for challenges. For challenges, awesome. Love that, great outlook. Any others that I missed? Excellent. Um, Doing gratitude for yourself is such a healthy exercise. Um, if you haven't done it, then do it. If you're already in a regular like routine of that, then we already know who you are because we love being around you. Um, so let's move forward. We've got, um, here's a reminder about our beliefs and our uh, what we believe in here in KW. We're going to keep moving forward. We want to make sure that you guys know about what's coming up. Again, this is going to be speed round. We're not going through all the details but just making sure that this is front of mind, top of mind, and this is in your emails. Uh, glow up your website. So this is uh, today, no, tomorrow, sorry, the 14th at one o'clock here um, in the training room. So if you didn't know, you guys all have a website, uh, whether you're, you're using it um, or whether it looks great, then this is a class for you, okay? January Production Awards, that's coming up on uh, the 20th. We have Death by Chocolate. We've talked a few times about this. What we need to know right now is um, the date, so you guys have that top of mind. March 16th 
It's going to be over at the Midvale office over there on Fort Union. Um, if you guys are interested in being a part of this and have questions, you can always reach out to Lisa Gonzalez. You can reach out to us. But uh, the overall purpose of this is to uh, spread love for to your clients and get them together and just do something that's outside of real estate that uh, these things have proven time and time again to help bring more business to um, your overall goals and uh, these client events. Okay, any questions on that one moving forward? All right, Red Day, save the date, May 9th. Uh, this is where we give back to the community. And uh, we have our, here we go, um, Carla. Did I, did I say that right? Carla, uh, come up here and tell us about your business. We are grateful for you being, um, this is, is this not, this isn't you. Okay, okay, I apologize. You looked at me like. Uh, <laughs> Carla's a little nervous, so I'm oh, going to okay. intro her right. if that's okay, okay Tyler. So Carla is my event planner. She's fantastic. If you uh, were able to swing by our Christmas party this year, Carla was behind all of that. So she had a DJ Grinch in there. It was awesome. We had 300 plus people. So I can't say enough about her. She's fantastic. Now you do have to come up. She's used to being behind the scenes, but she's going to talk to you a little bit more about her business. All right. I'll send her the bill for the doing that soon. But anyway, yeah, I am Carla Liffert. And um, everyone has my card there. If you want to follow me on Instagram, you can see some of my work. That's where most of my work is posted. Um, you can see the display that I did in the back. We were the ones, well, and also I'm not sure the other the business name, but we also, we um, sponsored lunch today for you guys. And we are really excited to work with Keller Williams um, because we are an event planning and services, but we also do it at an affordable cost. So we keep everything within our client's budget. And that's what makes us so affordable to real estate agents because we can come in and set up not only your, um, is this it, Aaron? Okay, oh, wrong way. Um, we can also set up for your open houses. Like if you would like a, like a cute display for your open houses, we can do that to just bring more clients in. Bex had her first one this past weekend um, at one of her open houses where the counter was decorated in a Valentine's Day theme um, with including all the food, all everything's theme operated. So you tell me what your theme is for that open house and we'll make sure that we get that done for you. Um, the same thing with corporate events. If you have an event coming up, then we come in and we take care of from A to Z. Um, and I only use Bex as a reference because she is one of, she's my Keller Williams client. And so we, again, take all that stress off of you and make sure that your clients know where to come, how to get there, all of that. And we take care of everything from A to Z for you. Um, so here's some examples of some events that we've done. Like I said, we do kid parties, uh, corporate events. This is the Christmas party from last year that was here at KW. And, um, that's who we are. And again, you can find us on Instagram. So thanks guys. Thank you for being here. And uh, without further ado, we want to move on to, we've got Jack Andrews coming and teaching us a little bit about investments and he's going to make us all rich today, right? We'll see. We'll see. Excellent. Do you want to clip on one or handheld? Uh, handheld is fine. Your life. Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're bringing up the presentation and okay. Perfect. This goes okay. All right. So, welcome to the class today. Just to get a feel for how many people have gotten into real estate investment. Uh, and who have dreams to do that, how many people would like to have uh, 10 or more doors in their life? Okay, a couple, a number, okay. How many would like to have five or more? Okay, how many have a door? Okay, good, great. So a lot of you guys have gotten some, uh, have gotten into this a little bit. 
For those that have not, uh, a lot of this will be new information. And for those that already invest, um, I hope to give you some things to motivate you to continue to invest, to invest in Utah and to give you some fun fundamentals and principles to cast a wider net, and, uh, invest in other places as well. Now, I don't know if this plays automatically. I hope so. Might have to click it. Let's see. There we go. Excuse me. Is that Apple for sale? Uh, yeah, we're about to put it on sale right now, actually. Well, I'm in the market, so tell me about your Apple. Why should I buy it? <laughs> nice try. Okay, people, here's how this is going to work. I have an Apple here. The highest bidder's going home with this. I want all bids in in the next two minutes, then we're closing it. Bidding starts at $5. Feeling pretty confident there, huh? I mean, don't you $10. think? $10. He said starting at 5 15 Is this a new Apple? Yeah, just listed. I'm pre-qualified. I'll pay cash. I got cash. 20 uh, 30 40 No, just make it 45 Is it even worth that? 50 I don't know. Please, this is the eighth Apple I've tried to buy. Could I at least see it up close? Uh, nope, it's an Apple. You know what it is. You either want it or you don't. I'll take it for 100 What? I'm from California. It's the cheapest Apple I've ever seen. 120 why did I do that? Why I don't I don't I want to be there and baby hey. How many of us have seen oh, how many of us saw that? Yes. Okay. But it accurately described where we were at in the market. And it was just insane. It was like five, ten, twenty, thirty, fifty, eighty, a hundred and ten K over market. And then <clears throat> what happened? Okay, that was part of it. But it t seemed like the spigot was just turned off. It was like demand, demand, demand. It's unsustainable. And all of a sudden, everything tanked. And then prices declined. And yes, interest rates was a major part of that. Inflation was a major part of that as well. And inflation tied into the increase of interest rates. So then we started to see... At the same time that these prices took off, you also started to see median household incomes drop because people were either cutting back in pay or employers were laying people off. And so now you have this massive gap in 2022, 2023 between the price of homes and interest rates coupling those. And all of a sudden people that were looking at a single family home or a town home or whatever their payment changes 1100 bucks from a projection 500 800 1100 bucks or more and so people that were considering mortgages in the 2600 range are now 3800 pushing 4000 single family homes 5000 bucks on a mortgage did that give a pause to the market oh my gosh it was it was insane so that gave a lot of investors, probably many in this room, it gave you a moment of pause. Like, should I still invest in real estate? Did anybody feel that? By show of hands, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna wait. I can't afford the interest rates. There's no, how many people have heard there are no properties that cap right now? Yeah, so a capita, and when I say cap, I'm referring to a capitalization rate, which we'll go over here in a second. Now, on your desk, you have a flyer that I created that will outline, in essence, as we go through this, I'm going to go through some slides and some information, and then towards the second half of this, we're basically going to have a conversation and some practical examples of the five incomes here. But you have five incomes, you have your... Uh, cash flow or capitalization rate. You have uh, principal pay down. You have capital appreciation. You have rental rate increases. And then you have your tax benefits or your tax shelters. And so we're gonna cover each of these in brief and the fundamentals that underlie them. Okay, so median household income in the United States, generally speaking, has continued to increase. Of course, you have dips, you have you know challenges, you have recessionary atmospheres where builder or where employers have to lay off or not pay as high, simply cannot afford it. Okay? 
The other thing you see, median sales prices of homes, they go up. Yes, you have dips. This is what I was talking about, basically 21, 22. You have a major dip there, okay? But then prices stabilize and prices rebound. Over the last 80 years, how many times have prices increased year over year in real estate out of 80 times? Pretty close. She, she said 75, 73 times prices have increased in the last 80 years. How many times have they decreased? Three. And then four times they have remained flat year over year. If I'm an investor, am I banking on capital appreciation? Yeah. It's a long-term gain. And real estate investment should be looked at as, um, have you ever sat on an afternoon and watched your lawn grow? Can't see it. But five days later, you can see it big time. And so that's kind of like real estate investment. You sit and you watch your lawn grow because it is, and it's growing across all the strands, everything, your lawn is growing. And after a while, you'll be like, holy crap, I can't cut this. And that's a great, that's great news, okay? All right, so some statistics. Look at the volatility. Where would it be a challenge? And I'm talking not just investing in Utah, but investing in a bigger net. Uh, casting a bigger net when you look for investment properties, where's one place that I might be a little skittish to invest? California would be one. The biggest one is the Northeast. Look at the purple. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up. You know? Still trending up, but a lot more volatility in your purchase prices. Okay? And then you look at the red. The red is the West region. Okay, that's us. And just generally speaking, you see price increases. Now, the biggest benefit of that red line is that we're seeing the highest, most significant price increases. You look at the, the Midwest. The Midwest grows, but not as aggressively. Okay? So the West region is growing. West region being Boise, being Salt Lake, Ogden, Provo, Utah, Southeastern Utah or Southeastern Idaho, all of these places are growing big time. You should look into uh, Eastern Oregon. There are places growing and booming where people want to be. Okay, we look at Utah and then you saw a dip in 21, 22 and then we're trending back up. But again, would I bank on price increases in Utah? You bet. Capital appreciation. That is a huge part of it. Now, interest rates. It is not intellectually honest for us to say that back in 1980-whatever, 1982-83, interest rates were 18.75. Okay? As, as an argument to solve the challenges of today's market is what I mean. Uh, because my dad bought a home, he cashed out his retirement, bought a home, $210,000, it was an estate in Connecticut, at 18.75% mortgage. Now, at the same time, bonds, government bonds, were earning 14 to 15%. Okay, what, what are bonds making today? Like 0.3 of 1%? You know, it's not a lot. And so the challenge that we have today is that if you get to interest rates in 6, 7, 8% at quadruple the price, it's just not tenable. It is a difficult thing. Affordability is a major, major issue and a major challenge for buyers to get into a house. Now, that actually presents the opportunity for the investor because what happens? If somebody can't buy, what must they do? They have to rent. Okay? They need a house. 
And so we continue to see population growth, both uh, from influx. There are so many things that are driving people to this state. We are the number one state in population growth over the last decade. Any reasons why? Off the top of your head. Okay, babies. We're actually reducing in that, but we do. I mean, there's obviously that generic population growth, and people will continue to have babies. So, okay, what's causing it? Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, people being able to and wanting to work remotely and not wanting the dens density. They don't want as much urban, they want rural. We saw a massive dynamic of that with COVID. They're like, get me out of here. People moving wholesale. Uh, I'll give you some other reasons. Safe place to live. Uh, highly educated multilingual populace. Diverse economy forward thinking infrastructure, low taxes, um, political strains, massive. Uh, California right now is taxing people when they leave. They don't say don't let the door hit you on the way out, it's we're going to hit you with the door and shove you out as you leave. So there's a lot of things to be said for that. And then the businesses, um, just some very notable examples. Adobe, 160,000 square foot, doubles their facility in Lehigh, another 160,000 square feet. And San Jose facility largely becomes token. Yes, it's still their headquarters, but it's a smaller footprint. And they're growing here. There's now five Amazon fulfillment centers and growing in the state of Utah. How many people are familiar with the um, inland port at Utah? Okay, the Inland Port is a big deal. It's the largest economic development in the state of Utah in our history. Do you know what an Inland Port is? Basically take Long Beach, California, and move it inland. So you've got freight, rail, truck, air, everything bringing goods from out of the country and processing them through an inland port and then sending them out logistically we become like the country's one of the country's biggest distribution centers. It is massive. The Salt Lake Airport. We have multiple phases of the Salt Lake Airport coming. How many people have been to Hartfield Jackson or Denver International? Hartfield Jackson in Atlanta, Denver International, okay? And you have to go down and you get on the tram and you ride out to your next terminal and your next terminal and your next terminal. The Salt Lake Airport has now been designed such that it can allow for and accommodate and expects that future expansion. Dig a tunnel out, build another terminal. Dig a tunnel out, build another terminal. Dig a tunnel out, a tunnel out, build another terminal. It's amazing. We are setting the groundwork for so much growth and development. Now, interest rates can affect that, but the case that you have to make not only to your buyers, but to yourself as an investor is, does it still make sense to buy investment real estate? And my answer is an absolute yes. Here's why. Those people that are in current houses, you look at the, the housing sales, it's dropped absolutely precipitously and we've seen that we've seen like a crunch on it nobody's listing nobody's listing nobody's listing and it's hard to make the case for somebody to list their home because interest rates and if i've got a two percent or a three percent interest rate on my current home why do i want to list it and sell it at a higher price or more and pay a higher interest rate that's a tough that's a tough argument, okay? I will tell you that there are investors right now that turn their current home into an investment and go and buy new real estate. They're renting their current home, 3,500 bucks a month. Roughly, they go subsidize the, their next purchase, buy another door. 
That may not be you, that may not be your game plan, but that is possible and people are doing it. I'm never selling the house that I'm paying two and a half percent interest on, never, that's free money. That one's amortizing and making me investment like beyond my wildest beliefs, that's great. Okay, so all of these things are contributing to when you have low sales, okay, and high interest rates and affordability challenges, it's driving people to the rental market. And so you see a glut of incoming population and a glut of demand. And so what happens? Rents go up. And now ever more important becomes the principle of location, location, location. Because if people have their rents going up, they're like, I got to be closer to stuff. I don't have the time to spend. I don't have the money to spend in gas. I can't do the commute. I've got to find a place that's close to the office if I have to go into the office. All of those sorts of things are contributing to the Salt Lake City rental rate growth. Now, um, it shows that this rise has become meteoric in some places. You know, 2022, 2023, we're, we're hockey sticking, you know, straight up. And if anybody thinks that this can't persist, I would take a 50 minute flight to the Denver market. The reason why I say that, how many are familiar with the interstates, the interstate system, kind of how, how it works? Uh, the interstate system was created by President, any ideas? Eisenhower. Eisenhower, after, this is, this is the, okay, this is the United States, okay? It's like, totally, it's awesome. So when he fought in World War II, uh, one of the challenges that the Germans had was logistically they got locked up. Okay, they, didn't, they couldn't deliver men and materiel to battle sites because they'd have like one city and you have seven roads into that city. And if the allies take that city, you've just shut off their supply lines in all those different directions. And so Eisenhower, in the case of invasion of the United States, wanted to fix that. So he did I-5, I-15, I-25, I-35, I-45, all the way out to the west coast, I-95, or east coast, I-95. North, south, I-10, I-20, or excuse me, I-90, I-80, I-70, 60, 50, 40, okay? So your even numbers for interstates run east-west and your odd numbers run north-south. So through Utah, we have the I-15 corridor. Through Denver, you have the I-25 corridor. Major, major, major thoroughfare, and it grows on both sides of I-25 I up and down. They have the Denver Tech Center, and for 25 years straight, they have seen massive, massive growth along the I-25 corridor in Denver. We see a similar dynamic on our I-15 corridor, but there's a problem, which we'll get to in a second and one of the other reasons why rents continue to increase, why property prices here will continue to increase, all of that. Okay, so all of that is to say that investment, the fundamentals of investment remain absolutely in place. Our vacancy rate remains under 5%, despite everything that we're building. And believe me, we're building. Edge is digging 40 to 45 holes a week. And a hole could be a 10-plex condo. And we literally cannot build them fast enough. Okay, people continue to come. People continue to fill them. And low vacancy rates. We have experienced quite the ride. Anybody feel like they've come up for air over the last five years? It's like... We went from the crazy bidding on the Apple out of control. That's this ride. And then all of a sudden, everything shuts off. And now we're like resetting. This dude's actually pretty good. Watch. He does a shoulder roll and almost lands on his feet. I'm like, that's, you didn't die, bro. That's pretty awesome. So, okay. Everybody has said 
when mortgage rates start to fall, what will prices do? Go up. Okay? So should you buy here or should you buy here? Or should you buy here? Or should you buy here? Or here? Or here? Yes. The principle of real estate is buy. Yesterday. Oh, ooh, she's ahead of me. Okay, what will interest rates do over the next year? Okay, got a Ouija board. I've got a crystal ball. And I've got a magic eight ball that tells me to ask later. And that would be my answer. I don't know what interest rates are going to do. But I will tell you that some people a lot smarter than me have predictions of the interest rates, and they don't see them doing much. Maybe getting down to a 6%. Okay? But let's say that you could change somebody's interest rate 1.5% or 2%. This is where new construction comes in. Okay? A buyer's purchasing power at seven and a half versus five and a half equates to about a five to seven hundred dollar a month savings. No, total. So if you look, uh, generally speaking, so for instance, 360 grand purchase, 2517 at seven and a half, and you drop about 500 bucks at a five and a half. Okay? So how can you make a two percentage worth of difference? and save somebody $6,000 a year in mortgage payments, or yourself as an investor. Okay, uh, that one shouldn't be there, but basically it is saying that red states are seeing an influx of population, population growth, and blue states less. Largely that's due to tax atmosphere. So, okay, here's your cost of waiting. It is not just the price of a home or interest rate. It is time. Okay? So the cost of waiting three years ago has cost you 15% roughly on a property. On a $450,000, 15%, that's over $65,000. The cost of waiting three years. You as an investor or your clients as buyers. How many of you have said, I'm going to wait the market out? How many of your buyers have said, I want to save up for a down payment? You can't outsave the market. Can't do it. So the cost of waiting is huge. All right. Now, speaking to the challenge, I talked about Colorado's meteoric growth for the last 25 years straight. They have just skyrocketed again because of their development all the way from north in Fort Collins to uh, an hour south of Denver, Colorado Springs, all the way down to Pueblo, which is another hour or so past Colorado Springs. It is boomtown. But here's the challenge with Utah. The white, and this actually, this isn't white. What I mean by white is white without marks on it, okay? So anywhere that you see white with no marks on it, that is where Utah can build land, or where we can build houses. What percentage of the 55 some odd million acres that Utah has, what percentage of that land can we build on? Any guesses? Less. 12%, who said that? Jesse, nailed it. Okay, 12%, so roughly about 6.7 million acres. That is equivalent to the size of Massachusetts. Anybody know where Massachusetts is on the map? There you go, Robin's got it. Yep, East Coasters. Right here. Massachusetts, take Massachusetts, put it into Utah. That's what we can build on. Will prices increase? Yeah, because you've got people coming in, population growth booming, and prices will go up. 
So that takes us to this. Let's have anybody, anybody remain unconvinced that the fundamentals of real estate investment remain in place. Nobody, nobody think that that's a bad idea, real estate investment. Okay, I agree. Real estate investment, fantastic idea. All right, so let's have a conversation. How do you calculate a capitalization rate? Any ideas? Somebody's Googling it. Got to be... Okay. Exactly. So your net operating income divided by your purchase price or property value, okay? So for the sake of easy numbers, I'm going to use a property that we have right now that I've shown to a number of agents recently. They say, you know, I need a good investment. I can't find anything that caps. And I just walked them right to a property that caps at 5.5% or better. And we're just going to calculate this out. Okay, so a $575,000 purchase price on a luxury townhome, five bedroom luxury townhome, unfinished basement. Uh, the guesstimate, if you look at Rentler and around the area surrounding in Harriman and Riverton, something that size is going to bring $3,000 to $3,500 a month. Uh, this particular townhome is 3,622 square feet, which, by the way, if you take that, divide that by that, how much is that per square foot? Largely, we're, we'll leave out finished versus unfinished, because the, what is the median price per square foot in the state right now? Yep, close. It's like 233, 229, 225, okay? So what is this number? Anybody got a calculator? Run that out for me. I think it's just under 160, like 157 bucks per square foot. Is that a value just in purchase price? Yeah. So now let's anticipate, let's say that we get $3,200 a month in rent. What is that number? Will somebody calculate that out for me? Thirty-two hundred times twelve. Yep. Thirty-eight thousand four hundred. What is? Call it ninety percent of that because we want to do a property management. Ten percent property management. Thirty-four. 560, okay? So pay attention to that number. Now, let's add to our 575 the cost of, let's say you have HOA reinvestment fees that run three, $4,000, okay? So we'll add that. Now we're up to 579K, okay? Let's add closing costs around 1.5%. Uh, that should add us another A. Let's put this property at 590K purchase price. Okay. Let's take this 3460 minus out a home warranty, 800 bucks for five years. Okay. And minus out another 1800 because your HOA is 150 bucks a month. Okay. Now, on new construction, largely, are you going to have um, are you going to have maintenance and or repair? Minimal. Frankly, most people on a pro forma put in nothing for the first five years on a new construction property. Okay? Maybe you have a couple of service calls to your home warranty. Okay? But roughly, this number should come out just about 30. 34 minus 1800, uh, so you're roughly 32.5, let's call it. Now, take 32,500 divided by 590,000, and I am being liberal, not conservative, on these numbers. And what percentage does that give you? 5.5. 5. 
And Google says, what is a performing cap rate? Depending on who you talk to, your cap rate should be four, five, five to 10 percent is considered a fantastic cap rate. Now, let's say that you d finished a basement for 60,000 bucks, okay, on this, adding that. So now your property value is 650, okay? But you add to this another, what, $1,600 in rent, 800 bucks per room? Call it 600 bucks a room. Let's call it, let's call it you get $4,500, okay? And it depends on, it depends on your strategy. If you're doing it to a family, you're probably not going to jump up from 3,200 to 4,500. But if you're doing it to four single people that want to live in Harriman Riverton, right close to everything, and they're each paying roughly a thousand dollars a month, a thousand, eleven hundred. Now you're forty-five hundred dollars times 0 0.9, which will give you property management. Okay, minus out the eighteen hundred for HOA, minus eight hundred for a home warranty, and divide that number by sixty thousand by. 500 and, or by 650,000 and what do you get depends on the builder depends on the community so in in an edge homes community sure you can you've got a two car garage plus a full driveway all four cars fit on the footprint of the property you have no parking issues the tenants have to coordinate coming and going but you've got almost an 8% cap rate in this scenario Correct. Yep. Edge. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Three unrelated and you have parking issues. And largely the issue, they're not balking about how many people are in the house. They're balking about whether or not they can clear the streets. Okay. And very often they'll even say, you can do whatever you want, but if you're discovered and we enforce it, then we'll charge you $25 a day until it's fixed. Okay, well, some people break the rules and say, I will pay the consequences of breaking the rules should you enforce. <laughs> Never happens, you know. But I'm just talking about this, this particular scenario. It's one of the best I've seen out there right now. And it's one of the reasons why I'm under contract on one of these. So I'm not just saying I'm doing. Okay, there are properties to be had. And there are properties that cap. Our townhomes cap. This luxury townhome caps. Okay? So, but that's just one of five incomes. Now let's talk about the next one. So, uh, the question was asked to me. They said, well, how much do I have to put down to get under the mortgage? I'm like, irrelevant. Mortgage is not calculated into cap rate. Okay? So, if you want to get the mortgage under so that you're not subsidizing a couple hundred dollars a month or whatever, that depends on you. You have to put down a certain amount. If you're not ready to buy or you're not comfortable subsidizing and writing off that loss on your taxes for a long-term gain, fine. But if you want to put down 25, 30, 35 percent on the property and receive a monthly cash flow on top of the dynamics here of a cap rate, fantastic. Okay, some people can, some people can't. It depends on your strategy. Every investor is different. Now, the next category is principal pay down. Who's paying your mortgage? Somebody else. Yeah. And so you purchase at $575,000 or whatever the number is, okay? And you start tanking on that mortgage and the property starts appreciating, and the gap between the two is called your wealth. It's fantastic. And then the bigger this gets, the bigger this gets, it just snowballs, guys. Because when this one grows, then you have the ability in a 1031 exchange to put down more money on a property. Better yet, put down 
half, half of this on one door and half of this on another door. You may initially have uh, losses that you write off on your taxes. Let's say you want to put just a 10% down. A 10% down that doesn't cover your mortgage, you end up subsidizing, okay? And typically, if you did a 10-year program at like a Cypress Credit Union or a Mountain America, you know, they'll have a 15-year balloon, but most times you're not in a property for 15 years. And you got 15 years to figure out how to exchange it and dispose of it. I have people that do that and take a phantom loss, minimal loss on interest, in order to capture 60, 70, 80 grand of equity in a red hot market. So there are absolutely ways to expand on this the more you get. It's like, anybody familiar with Dave Ramsey? Okay, Dave Ramsey has the seven baby steps of, of you know, income. And the first one is, uh, one month's savings. And then the next one is the debt snowball. You pay down all your debt. And then the third one is three to six months in savings. And then the next one is you begin putting 15% away into savings each month. And then the next one is you fund your kid's college education. And the next one is you pay down your house early. And then the last one is build wealth and give. Well, real estate investment is under the build wealth and give. But a lot of times, people don't have those other principles under control before they start to do this. So it starts to change when people have money in the bank and savings such that if they get into a car accident, let's say you're looking at an insurance policy. Does your insurance cost less if you have a $1,000 deductible versus a zero deductible? much less, particularly if you have teenagers. So if you're prepared and you have savings in the bank and all that stuff, you're saving yourself tons of money just in insurance because you can have a higher deductible. Why? You can absorb the potential cost of a car repair, okay? Similarly, what's happening here is as your real estate portfolio grows, you gain more leverage, okay? If you have, if you put down 25% on your very first property and you cash that out and roll that into a 1031 exchange or take out a commercial line on that property, you take out a commercial line on that property because you got 25% equity and maybe on your next property, you have 35% equity. And your next property, you have another 3%. Next property, another 3%. You then have the ability to leverage that property. We call them buckets of money. You have 401ks. You have lines of credit on your own home. You have commercial lines that you can take out on properties that you own. You have savings, personal savings. You have loans that you could take out. Where do you get the cash and capital to invest in these properties? Well, you have, you have a number of options, many of which people don't contribute or don't want to touch. Understandable. That's your, that's your play. But the combination of amortization, principal pay down, and uh, capital appreciation on one property, it was calculated, I heard from an intercap loan, uh, loan officer, it was calculated on one property that's $900,000 every 14 years. On one. Just the power of amortization, principal pay down, capital appreciation. It's like crazy. Okay. Now, I had a friend that did a 10 year experiment with his high school buddy. He says, I'm going to do exclusive real estate investment. And his friend says, I'm going to do exclusively stocks. It's a better thing. I'll play the stock market, all that stuff. And they, did, and they agreed to come back after 10 years. And I sat down with the agent who had done just real estate investment. And he had talked to his friend after 10 years. And I said, what did you, what did you find? He said, Jack, it was embarrassing. 
the difference. It was embarrassing. And he had been diligent stock market, and I had been diligent real estate. He says it was embarrassing. I almost wanted to give him a hug. Real estate investment is a fantastic, is the vehicle to wealth. Now, uh, we've gone through capital appreciation, principal reduction. Now, rental rate increases. You've seen rental rates continue to go up. But on a graph, if you have your purchase here, prices continue to go up, okay? And you have stopped right here, $575,000. And rental rates, let's say for the first year, maybe two rental rates don't capture what you wish or hope. But in year three, if this is home prices, first of all, you're already capturing this wealth because as the price goes up, you've already put your mark in the sand and stopped at 575 and now it's worth six and a quarter, right? Or X or Y or whatever. But furthermore, the lagging indicator of rental rates continues to come up, okay? Maybe you bought when rental rates were here, but rental rates continue to go up. Your expenses and your cost has gone down the property has appreciated, and you're adding another stream of income right in here. Not, not your expenses, excuse me, your, your principal. Your debt obligation has reduced. Now, over time, your expenses do go up, okay? And so you decide when to dispose of the property or exchange it, okay? Hopefully you're doing an exchange, which we'll discuss in the tax benefits here. But all I'm saying is the home price continues to go up. So you're capturing one stream of income right here. They are paying your principal down. So that is income stream number two. And then power loves a vacuum, as they say. Rental rates come right up in here. And that gives you income number three. Does that make sense? You're making more money on all of those streams. Now the, now the last one. The last one is your tax benefits. How many are familiar with a 1031 exchange? How many have done it? Okay. Only just a couple. How many... Capital gains. You can. Yep, 1031 is, all a 1031 exchange refers to is 
like for like, like capital for like capital, real estate for real estate, stocks for stocks, bonds for bonds, if that makes sense. Um, when you roll property in, one of the benefits, one of the tax benefits of real estate, you can depreciate a property, a normal depreciation schedule, you can depreciate a property over how many years? 27 and a half. So take the property value, divide by 27 and a half, 575,000, call it $15,000 a year that you're writing off your taxes, times, say you're paying a, a tax liability of 24%, 15K, 25%, you're paying off roughly $3,500, or you don't have to pay roughly $3,500 in taxes per year on a normal depreciation schedule on one door, okay? You have 10 doors, obviously that advantage is expounded massively at compounds. However, what happens if you did, uh, oh, and in order to avoid capital gains tax, you typically have to live in a property for how many of the previous five years? Two, okay. What happens if you never dispose of the property and you just 1031 exchange like we're discussing? It snowballs. You get better and better and better and better. And ultimately, if you do it 20 times in a row, you pay off your first two or three properties and hold liabilities on the other. Now, those first two or three properties are free and clear, collecting rent of $1,800, $2,000, That's $10,000 a month for the rest of your life. So the lawn just grew over the course of 20 or 30 years, okay? Now, I don't, I'm not gonna get into the weeds of this, but have a discussion with your accountant about cost segregation studies. Anybody familiar with those? Okay, just a handful, a couple of, of you. You just did one, okay, so did I, okay? So uh, a cost segregation study is advanced accelerated depreciation. Now there are certain, you could do it not being a real estate agent, but you can't write off as much as a real estate agent with it being your primary employee. The current tax code, I cannot remember the section right offhand, but the current tax code allows you, okay, yes, I think it is. Uh, it allows you as a real estate professional to write off all of that. So I just paid $3,500 on one condo, paid $3,500 for a cost seg study, they said I can write $57,000 off of my taxes. That saved me $24,000 in tax liability. Don't have to pay it. Okay. Beautiful. Yep. Okay. So you do an accelerated depreciation. What in essence you are doing is while let's say a roof has a 30 year life and you would depreciate that in a normal schedule. What about carpet or paint? Those wear out much quicker and repeatedly. And so what they do in the cost segregation study is they pull that depreciation forward into buckets. They call them like five, seven, 15 year and 27 and a half year. Long story short, I don't have to pay $24,000 in taxes. Now the question is asked, yeah, but if you sell it, don't you have to recapture that, that uh, depreciation? Yeah. Yeah, because I lowered my basis in that current property. So if I sell it, I have to pay a depreciation recapture. What if I don't sell it? What if I just exchange it, a 1031, over and over and over and over again? Well, at some point, they say, you're going to have to pay the piper. Yeah, but then my heirs pay the piper, right? No, exactly. Current laws allow for you to transfer all of that real estate to your heirs with a one-time exception in basis, a one-time step up, meaning they don't have to pay that depreciation. They don't have to capture it. You turn over an empire of real estate wealth to your heirs tax-free.
Tax-Free. Read the book, Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. Talk to your accountant about cost segregation studies. Come up with a plan for your real estate investment properties and call me to buy one. No lie. I love this stuff. I love helping you raise and you grow and you raise and you get more real estate property and I'm benefited absolutely 100%. But this is the vehicle to wealth. It is your way to do it. And don't talk to me about 10 doors until you have one. Because one is your toughest. You've got to save, in my mind, to, be, to get a good foundation, I would save 25 to 30%. You get an interest rate break on an investment property, on your first investment property, at 25%. Okay? But maybe you don't want to do it that mate that way. Maybe you want to buy your first property, own or occupy it, and move out a year or two later and maintain that mortgage lower and then get another owner-occupied property. How about doing it that way? There are ways to invest, and a lot of you are real estate investing right now, whether you realize it or not. But so many people teach and do not do. We teach our clients the significance of buying real estate, and it's real. The cost over 30 years, the difference between renting and buying on one $450,000 property over 30 years between renting and buying, if they were to rent for 30 years or buy, what's the cost to their bottom line wealth? Huge. Any guesses? Okay. About four and a half million dollars. One door, and that's at a 7% interest rate. What is it at a 12% interest rate? 3.9 million dollars. There's your 600,000. Interest rate is largely irrelevant in the calculation of rent versus buy. I, it's, I cannot underscore it. I want to shout it from the rooftops. I want you to buy and 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 you to buy all from me. Because new construction, frankly, is a fantastic way to do it. Now, are there hits and misses in real estate investment? Is there risk? Yeah. Yep, big time. But a lot of your risk is in purchasing, for instance, people will say, you know, I got, uh, I got a property that caps at 18% in the foothills of Kentucky. And I'm like, okay, good. Did you do... Did you do your due diligence? What do you mean? I'm like, okay. <laughs> when it comes to exchanging that, can you sell it? He's like, well, it will probably require some rehab. Uh-oh. Did you calculate that onto your pro forma? Well, I, you know, I figured we'd just move there for a month or two and, and take care of it. Hope to see you on HGTV, <laughs> you know? There are risks and you do have to do your due diligence and everybody feels strongly about or fills out a pro forma differently. A pro forma being basically my spreadsheet calculation, if you will, of how this property will perform. It puts in my expenses, it puts in my anticipated vacancy rate. You know, in some places you have to calculate a significantly higher vacancy, you anticipate one, two, three months a year of vacancy. All of that sort of stuff adds up, stacks up. Uh, HOA, lots of times your HOA reinvestment or your HOA monthly assessments increase. Okay, you have to calculate for those sorts of things. You have to calculate for inflation. So this is a general overview of the principle, but you absolutely can find fantastic investment properties in new construction today that will serve you very, very well. Okay? 
And so learn about these principles. Take a Udemy course in it. Watch YouTube videos on cost segregation studies. Read Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. Read other books that discuss this sort of thing. And then teach and do. And once you do, you can better teach. So, okay, don't be, don't be the university, pressure, uh, pr university professor that teaches the saying that says, those that teach can't, you know, don't be that agent. Do it. Jump in. Learn. So I invite you to invest in real estate. I offer myself as a resource anytime. I honestly, um, that's a lie. I was going to say, I honestly don't care if you buy from me or somebody else. So that's a lie. But of course, I want to help, and I feel like I have options. I had a buyer January last year, uh, came to Edge Homes with $12 million, and uh, wanted to invest. And I helped him purchase 34 units that he paid cash for. We negotiated a massive transaction for it. Now, and I said, how did you do this? He says, I started, I started investing in real estate when I was 17 years old. And I was like, holy crap. And how old are you now? 40? Okay. Great. And he's nothing special. He's nothing special. So absolutely fantastic. That can be any one of us. I appreciate your time, and I hope this was of value. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you, Jack. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, we've got something that we are implementing and moving forward with. Everyone grab your phones. You'll see some QR codes on the sides. We want to hear from you. We want feedback on these different meetings. So uh, Jack is our guinea pig. Thank you, Jack. Um, no, but we actually, we want to uh, incentivize and make it fun. So you'll see that this is um, KWCE continuing education. So we want to help you make sure that you're learning. Uh, you've got one over there, one on that side. We want your feedback. It's really short. It'll take you like 10 seconds to fill out. So uh, as soon as you're done with that, thank you for lunch, Carla. And if you have questions for either Carla or Jack, you can find them on the side, grab some food, get feedback and have a great day.